Hi, in this video, we're going to cover the second part of the digestive system. So let's go ahead and start with the pharynx. The pharynx is going to be this cavity behind your oral cavity and your nasal cavity. It's going to be right around here. All of this back here is part of the pharynx. As you can see, if you follow the pharynx down, it eventually becomes the esophagus. The pharynx is the passageway for food, fluids, and air. Um, the histology of it resembles the oral cavity, so it's going to be lined with stratified squamous epithelium. There are three parts to the pharynx to remember. Nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Remember, these are not specific structures, but areas, and they are important to remember. Up here, so all of this is the pharynx. By the way, this is the larynx over here. So the larynx eventually becomes the trachea, which is your windpipe, and the pharynx, if you follow it down, eventually becomes the esophagus. So where the nasal cavity and the pharynx meet, this area, this is called the nasopharynx. Where you have the oral cavity and the pharynx meet, this is called the oropharynx. And where you have the larynx right here, and the pharynx meet, this is called the laryngopharynx. So we're going to follow the pharynx down, which eventually becomes the esophagus. The esophagus is this long muscular tube. It is mostly composed of smooth muscle. And remember, smooth muscle is for involuntary movement. Once you swallow the food, it's going to go down. You have no control of it after that point. As a matter of fact, it's so strong that if you stood upside down after swallowing, the esophagus is still going to contract and push the food down to your stomach. Remember that the esophagus, while it has all the layers of the mucosa, it doesn't have serosa. Instead, it has something called adventitia on the outermost layer which is made out of um, dense connective tissue. There's also going to be some uh, sphincters on the top portion and bottom portion of the esophagus. And whenever you're not swallowing, the esophagus is collapsed. So it only opens up when you're swallowing, and it squeezes the bolus down to your stomach. Okay, so here, remember here was the pharynx, back of the mouth, um, here, this is going to be the esophagus, right here. There's going to be two sphincters here, the upper gastroesophageal sphincter over here, kind of works as a valve, and the lower um, gastroesophageal sphincter, and I'll talk about this more when we get to the stomach. Okay, the stomach, so if we follow this down, the esophagus down, you can see that the esophagus pretty much expands to form this pouch called the stomach. So it is continuous. So we can see the stomach right here. It is more on the left side of the abdominal pelvic cavity, and it's really more towards the upper portion. Um, this is a temporary storage area. So the stomach is going to be this temporary storage area, which is going to further break down the food physically and chemically. It's going to break it down into smaller and smaller pieces, but also there's going to be gastric juices here that are going to break down the food chemically, making it ready for absorption. When the food is combined with these gastric juices and um, acids, it forms the slurry called the chyme. And the chyme is 
very acidic. So the content in your stomach is going to be very acidic. The size of the stomach varies. Um, it could be anywhere between 15 to 25 centimeters long. And the volume depends on how much food is in it. So depending on the time of the day, the size might vary. It's not very large when you wake up in the morning, but as you start eating, it will expand. I remember that the stomach moves around, it churns. So it's not gonna be like, in, it is gonna stay in this specific area, but it's constantly gonna be moving around. So the anatomy, these are some of the parts, some of the regions of the stomach. The fundus, the body, the cardia or cardiac region, and the pyloric region. You gotta remember those. So I'm gonna, this is, draw them over here. This is a uh, very simplified picture of the stomach, but it works. So here, this is going to be the esophagus. Right here, you're going to have a sphincter, which sort of acts like a valve. This is called the gastroesophageal sphincter. If you want to be very specific, we call it the lower gastroesophageal sphincter. Now the dome-shaped area, right here on top, this is called the fundus. By the way, things that are dome-shaped in anatomy are just called fundus. So when we get to the reproductive system and we're talking about the uterus, um, the dome-shaped area of the uterus is also called the fundus. Right below the esophagus, so right around this area, this is going to be the cardiac or the cardia region. I believe it is called that because it is um, the area that's closest to the heart. And then the mid portion, so around from here. To about here. Uh, this is going to be the body of the stomach. And the area that becomes narrow to form this funnel shaped area, uh, this is called the pyloric region. And by the way, this is right here, this is going to be the small intestine, the beginning of the small intestine. And you're going to have another sphincter around here called the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter controls when the chyme is moved into, into the small intestine. So remember that the stomach is a temporary storage area. It keeps it there, breaks it down, and when it is ready, it, it's released into the small intestine. Here are some other parts that we need to remember. Uh, we talked about the pyloric sphincter or valve already. It controls um, the emptying action of the stomach. We need to go over the greater curvature, the lesser curvature, the greater omentum, lesser omentum, and the rugae. So let's look at those.
So you can see that the stomach is going to make these curves around it. There's this one curve right here, this curve, and also this curve over here. So this smaller curve here is called the lesser curvature. And this bigger curve here is called the greater curvature. And what you're going to see attached to these curvatures on a lot of model is um, omentum, which is uh, made out of fat. So let me see if I could draw it out here. So what you're going to see is right here, there's going to be fat attached to the lesser curvature and to the greater curvature. So the fat here, the omentum here, is called the lesser omentum. And this one over here, this sheet of fat that's connecting to the greater curvature is called the greater omentum. Rugae, those are the folds inside the stomach. So if you open the stomach up, you're going to see that the mucosa forms these wrinkles. Those are called rugae. Um, you can see this picture over here, which has pretty much everything labeled. Here's the lesser curvature, but you can't see the omentum in this picture. Here's the greater curvature. And if you open it up, you're going to see these folds on the inside called the rugae. Here's the pyloric sphincter. Remember that for the pyloric sphincter, or for any sphincter to form, this is where the muscularis externa becomes very thick to form this valve-like structure here. Here is the lesser omentum. You can see it right here, this sheet of fat. And here is the greater omentum over here. So this greater omentum is going to hang over your other abdominal pelvic organs. We also need to know um, the muscles that are in the stomach. Remember that the muscularis externa has a longitudinal layer and a circular layer. However, whenever it comes to the stomach, it has one additional layer, and that is called the oblique layer. You do need to be able to identify these. So let's take a look at them. So of course, on the very outside, the first thing you would have is a serosa, this saran wrap-like sheet covering the organ. Next, uh, if you peel that off, you're going to find these three layers of muscles. The first one is going to be the longitudinal layer. So how do you identify it? Well, you really have to look at the muscle fibers and see how they are oriented. So if we look at the longitudinal layer right here, you can see these muscle fibers. Go along the length of the stomach. So therefore, they're called longitudinal. Let's look at the circular layer. By the way, a longitudinal layer is the outermost muscular layer. Circular layer is going to be right underneath that. Look at the muscle fibers here. They circle around the stomach. Therefore, it's called circular layer. And the innermost one, and this is the one that's unique to the stomach, the oblique layer, this is going to be uh, muscle, it's going to have muscle fibers that go diagonally, as you could see. Therefore, it's called oblique. OK, 
Okay, so it's really important to remember these structures, not just for your lecture exam, but also for your lab exam. I don't go over any models in this video, but I do have lab videos where I go over the models. So what I want you to do is take a minute and try to label this diagram over here. And by the way, it's not perfect, but um, we're going to work with whatever we have. Um, try to label things before we move on to the small intestine and the large intestine. Okay, okay so I'm going to go ahead and label this to make sure that we got everything correctly. So right here, you have the esophagus. Right below the esophagus, right here, you would have the gastroesophageal sphincter. Remember that this sphincter um, ensures that the stomach acid doesn't move up into your esophagus area. Okay, right here, this area below the gastroesophageal sphincter, this is called the cardia region. This dome-shaped area right here, this is called the fundus. I don't really like the way that they labeled the muscles. Um, this one right here, with the muscle fibers going along the length of the stomach. This is called longitudinal. This one over here, the specific one, this is the circular layer. And this one with the muscle fibers going diagonally, this is called the oblique layer. This is going to be the lesser curvature right here. Over here, there would be lesser omentum, the fat attached to it, but you can't see it in this particular diagram. This one over here, this is the greater curvature. Um, the folds inside the stomach are called rugae. I believe what this one here is trying to show you is the pyloric region. And this is trying to show you a part of the body, I believe. The so body would be like from here to around this area over here. This mid portion is the body. Um, here, this is the pyloric sphincter. Remember that the sphincters, the way that they form is that um, the muscularis externa, as you could see, becomes ve very large in this area to form this valve-like structure. And this is what controls um, the emptying action of the stomach into the small intestine. And this is the beginning of the small intestine right here, called the duodenum. Okay, next we're gonna go to the liver. So we have the stomach on the left side, and as you can see on the right side, we're gonna have the liver. The liver is the largest gland in your body, weighs about three pounds in the average adult, 
located under the diaphragm and mostly contained in the rib cage, the liver is going to have four lobes. The right lobe, which is the largest lobe, the left lobe, uh, the caudate lobe, and the quadrate lobe. So this is when we're looking at the liver anteriorly. So when you look at it in someone's body, it looks like something like this. As you can see, the right lobe right here, all of this is the right lobe. Um, this is the largest lobe of the liver. Here is the left lobe. In this picture here, you're looking at the liver upside down. So you're looking at it from the inferior view. You could only see the caudate lobe and the quadrate lobe from the inferior view. Again, this large lobe right here, this is the right lobe. This is the left lobe. Here's the caudate lobe over here. Okay. So here's caudate, right here, all of this. And here's quadrate. As you can see, the caudate lobe and the quadrate lobe technically are part of the right lobe. Now, how do you tell the difference between these two? So caudate, if you think about what this term means, or the word caudal means, caudal means tail. So whoever was coming up a, with a name for this anatomical structure taught that it looks like a little tail. So they called it caudate lobe. Right here, looks like a little tail. Quadrate, think about the term quad, it means four angles, right? Well, this lobe over here is gonna form four angles. That's why it's called quadrate. So caudate doesn't have the four angles. Instead, it looks like a little tail. Quadrate has four. Okay, so the, func the liver has multiple functions. It's involved with metabolism, it's involved with recycling red blood cells and things like that. But the, the digestive function of the liver is to produce something called bile. Bile is what helps break fat into smaller and smaller components and makes it digestible. The gallbladder is a storage organ. The excess bile that you don't need gets stored in the gallbladder. Here's the liver right here, and underneath it, this green organ that you see here, this is the gallbladder. Um, and right here, this is the common bile duct over here. So when the stomach, let's look at the stomach, um, is breaking down food content and forming chyme, it's eventually gonna be released into the duodenum, the beginning portion of the small intestine right here. And then, um, as you could see, the bile duct also connects to the duodenum. So it's going to secrete bile to help break down fat content in this kind. Um, remember that some people do get their gall gallbladders removed, can't survive without it. Uh, usually, when people have the, their gall gallbladder removed, they can't have um foods that are high in fat so they usually have to monitor what they're eating the pancreas also a very important digestive organ remember it, this is an endocrine organ but it's also an exocrine organ it's involved with regulating your blood sugar but it's also going to be involved with secreting pancreatic juices um, the pancreatic juices are going to have a lot of enzymes in them that are necessary for breaking down food content. On average, we produce 1,200 to 1,500 milliliters of pancreatic juice. It is very high in pH, and this is important. High in pH means basic. The chyme in your stomach is very acidic. So this pancreatic juice, not only does it help break down the content, but also it neutralizes the stomach acid, um, excuse me, not the stomach acid, the chyme that is entering your duodenum. It's going to be mostly con 
consists of water, enzymes, and electrolytes. Here are some of the enzymes right here um, that are secreted in the pancreatic juice. You should remember what they do. Protease is for breaking down proteins. Amylase is for breaking down starches. Lipith, lipase is for breaking down fat. And nuclease is for breaking down nucleic acids. So the small intestine right here, the, it has three parts. This is the beginning portion. This is called the duodenum. Not very long. The beginning portion attaches to the stomach. The second part, the green, this is called the jejunum. And the last part, the ileum, think about this like as the part that sits in the iliac portion of your hips. Um, the last part, which connects to the large intestine towards the very end, is called the ileum portion. So really just three parts, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. The function of the small intestines is to absorb pretty much almost all absorption of food content takes place in your small intestines. And the reason why the small intestines are so long is because they need increased surface area for absorption. Whenever we talk about the small intestine and the large intestine, we're talking about width. We're not really talking about length. As far as the length goes, the small intestine is much longer than the large intestine. Um, also, some other structures that increase surface area for absorption are the circular folds. This is when the mucosa of the small intestine forms these circles, villi and microvilli. Also, amplify absorption, help amplify the surface area for absorption. Again, we talked about the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. You don't, you should be able to identify them, but you don't really need to know how long each one is. So I want to talk about the circular folds because I don't have a picture on this. If we take a portion of the small intestines out right here, say this is a portion of the small intestine, and we cut it open. Uh, we make a longitudinal cut. What you're going to see is that the mucosa on the inside forms these circular folds like this. The wrinkles inside the small intestines are circular. These are called plica circularis. or circular folds, same thing. Also, if we get a closer look, we look at it under the microscope, if you guys remember that mucosa slide, um, what you're gonna find on the mucosa are these finger-like projections in the small intestine, like this. These are called villi. Again, another structure that's going to help increase surface area for absorption. Now, if we take a closer look at a villi right here, and really expand it, what's going to align this villi is a layer of simple columnar epithelium. And if you look at the simple columnar epithelium, going back to AMP1, what a lot of them have on the top are these little projections, these little cytoplasmic projections called microvilli. So again, the larger ones are the villi, the little cytoplasmic extensions on top are microvilli, all which help increase surface area for absorption. Okay, now let's talk about the large intestine. 
The large intestine, again, we call it large because of how thick it is and not necessarily how long it is. It frames the small intestines on three sides. Starts at the ileocecal valve. This is the connection between the large intestine and the small intestine. And ends at the anus. The function, really the main function of the small, the large intestine is to move feces out of the body, but also to absorb whatever water is remaining from that food residue. It temporarily um, stores the residue, and of course it eliminates feces from the body. Now if this uh, feces tends to move too fast, it doesn't stay in your large intestines for too long and enough water doesn't get absorbed, that's when you get diarrhea. If it stays there for too long and too much water gets absorbed, that's when you get constipation. Here are some anatomical structures that you need to remember for the large intestines. It looks like a lot, but they're really easy to remember. So first, let's look at the colons. Ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and sigmoid colon. Okay, here, this is where the small intestine and the large intestine get connected. This is called the ileocecal valve. This first colon right here, all of this, this is called the ascending colon. This is called the transverse colon, which makes sense because transverse meant horizontal. This is the horizontal colon. This is the descending colon right here. And the sigmoid colon is from here to about right here. It makes an S shape. So sigmoid is going to make an S shape towards the end. You then have the right colic flexure, or right hepatic flexure is another term, or also you have the left colic flexure, or left splenic flexure. These are basically where the large intestines make an angle, they turn. So we could see them right here. This angle over here, this turning point, and this turning point over here. Right colic flexure, or you could call it hepatic because the liver is going to be on this side. This is called the left colic flexure, or splenic, because the spleen is on this side. Remember, you only have one spleen and one liver, and they're on opposite sides. Okay, here are some other flexures. I mean, here are some other structures to remember. The hostra, tenai coli, cecum, appendages, the appendix, and the ileocecal valve. These pouch like structures right here. These things, these are called hostra. Tenai coli looks like a ribbon. You see the structure here? Right here. Right here. This is the tenai coli. It looks like a ribbon and it is made out of smooth muscle. And I believe it is involved with the moving action of this the feces. Now if we look at the ascending colon you see this very large hostra here called the cecum and this is the appendix and this is the structure again that sometimes uh, people have to remove it is involved with your immune system and I think it had a more important function in our primitive ancestors because they ate food that was raw which was higher in bacterial content so it was important to have this here. And it may not be as important um, 
with the diets that we currently have because we eat cooked meat and there's less bacteria in them. Appendages. These little structures here are appendages. These little things of fat that are hanging from the large intestine and their function is really unknown. The last part we have the rectum up here and then the anal canal over here. Again on top you have the rectum and then you have the anal canal. The anal canal is going to have two sphincters around it. You have the internal anal sphincter and the inter external anal sphincter. External, if I remember correctly, the internal anal sphincter is involuntary and the external anal sphincter is voluntary. 